Welcome to the PopGo Project Podcast, a platform for the discussion and discovery of arts and entertainment. We focus on highlighting people and events that add value to the world around us. Visit us on all social media platforms by searching The PopGo Project or visit our website at thepopgoproject.com. Welcome to the show and thank you so much for listening. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by Keller's Garden Center and Landscaping Services. Are you still cutting your own grass? Are you still trying to get your landscaping to look perfect on your own? That sounds sweaty. That sounds like a lot of work. That sounds like a job for Keller's Garden Center and Landscaping Services. Family owned and operated Keller's Garden Center and Landscaping Services located on Kern Street in Exeter near Blue Ribbon Dairy has the quality and experience to get your yard looking its best. The garden center offers plants, trees, sod, mulch, rocks, flowers, topsoil, grass seed, straw bales, and much more. While the lawn and landscaping services offers mowing, trimming, planting, and full landscaping. And also new at Keller's Garden Center is the Zen Chaser Bonsai Studio, offering bonsai trees, supplies, and classes. Visit them on their social media page for more info. Keller's Garden Center and Landscaping Services. Get your free estimate today. doing i'm very well how are you good man well, with the band the nocturnal affair from uh las vegas mm-hmm. what's it like out there right now is it still warm it's finally getting really nice yeah for finally. about four to eight weeks out of the year it's perfect and we have a renaissance fair coming up halloween happens it's gorgeous and then right after Thanksgiving, it kind of sucks, but it's not as sucky as winter everywhere else in the country. Yeah, so you're saying it's beautiful right now. What, what uh, Describe beautiful, because for me right now, it's been rainy and shitty and 40 degrees. In the middle of the day, it's like 65 or so, but... It's like 75, 76 degrees in Vegas, nice and cool, not humid. Yeah. And then sun goes down, maybe goes to like 69 to 70. Nice. But yeah. I've only been to Vegas once, and that was uh, back in 2017, and my wife was pregnant at the time. So uh, good for me, because I was able to have a good time. But she's like my partner in crime. So it's like, you know, she was, you know, she couldn't have a good time as far as, you know, partying and shit like that. So I had to kind of, you know, just by default, kind of kept it cool. But yeah, I'll have to go back. There's a bar there I want to go to really bad. Uh, Brewdog. They just put a bar on the top of uh, the rooftop on the strip there, I think. Yeah, I heard about that one. Yeah, a little sweet. But we're not here to talk about Brewdog or Vegas for that matter. We're here to talk about the nocturnal affair. Um, and you're coming up we're in about a week or so. Actually, by the time this airs, you might already be on tour with Fozzie. Cool. Okay. What's the, yeah. What do you think about that? Like, what, you, what, what are your, uh, what, what, that sounds uh, pretty neat. I'm pretty excited. This is going to be our third time going out with them. Our second time going out with Seventh Day Slumber. And also Magdalene Rose. I, I always mispronounce her name. I always say Magdalena or, or whatever, but it's, uh, she's absolutely fantastic. She fronted GFM when we were doing our first tour with Fozzie. And She's got some of the coolest vocals I've heard in the business. And I believe she's going to be playing with Seventh Day Slumber, who they're just like the sweetest people I've ever met. So and of not, course, not amazing. your first time. Not your first time with Fozzie. Yeah. That's, uh, that's interesting. What was that like before? They really kind of taught us the way of the road in the most professional way possible. I know. The Fozzie boys have been doing it for a long time. I know Rich and the rest of the guys were doing it with Stuck Mojo for a hot minute. And they're just so professional. They're so kind. They're not crazy partiers. They get in. They put in the work. They have fun. They make sure everybody that shows up has fun. And they move on. It's really cool. So they're pros. Completely. I mean, I know 
I only know of Fozzie because they were actually uh, in town probably five years ago in the uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania area, FM Kirby Center. Um, and I mean, Chris Jericho. I mean, what else you got to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm not completely familiar with the music, but people, uh, you know, people get pumped about it. Yeah. Um, you have you haven't heard a lot of Fozzie's music? No, I haven't. It's good, man. I mean, it's stuck mojo with Chris Jericho singing. It's really cool. Okay, and they work with some really cool producers. I mean, Rich Ward is one of the sickest guitar players I've ever seen, and he's got a killer voice on top of it too. And so do the rest of the guys. The rest of the guys are extremely vetted in their instruments, and they've all got great voices. So it's pretty cool. Very cool. Well, talk to me about the nocturnal affair. Um, you know, when you guys started, uh, the music is is awesome. Um, uh, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, the song. What is it called? Uh, she didn't write it down. It's that good. I forgot about it. No, um, it's actually like the the top song on uh, the Spotify playlist. Um, it's not your most listened to song on Spotify, surprisingly, which is weird because I think it's the best one. But that's just my opinion. Who do I know? I appreciate that. <laughs> but I mean, it, it has like a almost like a Breaking Benjamin vibe to it. Um, your music. I don't know if that's an, uh, a compliment or an insult. Um, a huge compliment to me. Yeah, those guys are fantastic. Yeah, I mean, they're from where I'm from. Um, I have the an honor of knowing uh, a couple of those guys, but uh, a thousand ways to die is the song I'm talking about. Oh, cool man! Yeah, that's a cool tune. Um, but talk to me about uh, the band um, when you guys started, how how it all came together, um, the, the style. I mean, I kind of already alluded to the fact that it sounds a little bit like Breaking Benjamin, but I mean, it's probably more than just that. I started the band back, I want to say, in 2014, 2015. As a joke, it was under another name, and we played our first show at the House of Blues in Las Vegas, and it was a corporate event. We opened up for a Duran Duran cover band, and the place was packed wall to wall. It was full. People went crazy for us. We got off stage, and people bum-rushed us looking for merch, and at the time, it was just the joke band. We were even anonymous. It was me and a few other guys from another band I was in. And we covered our faces and we did a few originals and uh, I, I think like a Cure cover or something like that. And um, when we got bum rushed off the stage, I was like, okay, maybe I have something here. 2017, changed the name and started kind of writing a little bit more from the heart. Started working with Logan Mater. 2019, went on our first tour with the 69 Eyes. Started working with John Moyer from Disturbed for this project. I've worked with him in the past. He's fantastic. And uh, now we're here. Well, that was a quick version. What were you playing uh, like back when you first started that, you know, it was a joke? And Well, it, I, it wasn't a joke like I was making fun of the genre. It was a joke like I wasn't really taking it seriously because I needed a passion project so I could kind of get the nerves out uh, while I had a few metal bands going and they were driving me a little crazy because I'm a bit of a control freak and the bands I was in, everybody was kind of fighting to get their vo voice heard, fighting for the limelight. And so I needed something to where I could get my ideas out, feel good about it and um, not worry about anybody else's opinion. So that's why I started this. So I was a big fan. I still am a big fan of, you know, Sisters of Mercy, The 69 Eyes, Typo Negative, David Bowie, Peter Murphy, like all that other goth stuff. And so it was like pretty slow, drudgy, saying really low, a bunch of other stuff. And uh, really inspired by that, that era of music. Yeah, I mean, it has definitely like a, a early to mid 2000s vibe. If you listen to our demos, I think it's still on Spotify. Mm -hmm. uh, that's that's kind of where we were at. It was it was a little bit like we we're a little punk rock with how we do shit. We sound a little crappy. It's kind of on purpose, kind of just because we don't give a fuck. 
Yeah. And uh, and then we ended up getting managed by Des Fafara 2017. He was like, where the fuck did you guys come from? And uh, we did a few, few newer tracks. And then uh, us and Des kind of parted ways. But we're still on good terms. And uh, now, you know, moved on. Well, the type of music you you uh, perform and record, you're very like, just real, just chill. Do you save it for the stage? Is that what you do? Uh, normally, I'm actually pretty goofy, but I'm just exhausted. I've been uh, I've been working all day in the studio. We're actually I'm working with a, a new producer right now on an upcoming single that we're going to be dropping here soon. And uh, it was a long day, but it was a good day. It was very awesome. Really cool guy to work with. I'm just tired. <laughs> Can you say who that is? Because I mean, um, you you told me earlier today. Because yeah, it's been a long day. You were up early. You thought you missed this interview because you thought it was nine a.m. But it's actually nine p.m. on yeah. Wednesday. Um, but Back the producer, you, please. The producer um, has uh, a pretty uh, decent. Um, yeah, yeah, I can talk about him. Yeah, uh, right. it's John. And I'm currently in Atlanta, Georgia. Beautiful Atlanta, Georgia. This place, it's, I love it here because I'm from the East Coast. I'm from Boston. And I love the South. I love New Orleans. I love Florida. I love all the Southern. I just love the, the hospitality, the food. It's just like the weather. It's so, it, it's probably just because it's so different than living in a dry ass desert all the time. So, anywhere sure. in the East Coast, the South, I'm just having a blast. So, currently, in a place called Peach Tree Corners outside of Atlanta. And it, it feels like I'm in Massachusetts right now. It's not too cold. It's not too humid. But so it's like there's an East Coast aspect, to like what's available for food and the people. But then there's also the Southern comfort of it as well. It's, it's such an interesting experience. And Johnny Andrews, you said, has worked with uh, bands like Hailstorm, Motionless and White, also from my area. Uh, yeah. And three days grace, yeah. So that's pretty cool. many, many, many more. He, yeah. He's also he works with Fozzie a lot. He does a lot of their really, really great tracks with them. Like I believe he worked on "I Still Burn." Uh, he's responsible for Judas. Like he's the dude is just a great producer, and he brings out the best in every artist he works with. Is this your first time working with him? And what's that been like? We hit it off. I mean, he's really cool. He's very funny. So it's it's kind of hard for us to stay on track because we'll do something we'll get we'll get somewhere with the song and then one of us kind of pipes up a joke about it and then it reminds us about this and then we next thing we know we've been talking for like 45 minutes like oh right yeah we're here for a reason like let's do it so he's really great he's super cool yeah that's neat um has he brought out a different aspect of of the band and during this process yes yeah. And, uh, and what, what uh, aspect? Well, he's, he's bringing his songwriting style to the table as well. So usually I write everything for Nocturnal. And I'll have my guitar player, Andy, come in and like redo guitars because he's one of the best guitarists I've ever met in my life. And he writes amazing solos. He writes fantastic riffs. And he just like, he can take a, something I've written or something I haven't written and he can just add to it and it make it sound phenomenal. But most of the time I write like the, the, the basic skeleton of the song and bring it to, you know, either if I'm working with John Moyer or Logan Mater, I'll bring it to them and they kind of help, you know, mold it. But with Johnny, we've started from scratch and it's really a, a, a team effort on this. And it's a new adventure for me because I'm not used to doing this, but he's being very patient. And he is a very good communicator and he's very good at telling me why my idea will work or my idea won't work for the goals we've set for the upcoming single, like where we would like it to land and what I want to do with it and, and, you know, where I would like my career to go. And so he's like, you know, you could make it sound like Mr. Bungle and Tom Waits and, you know, all the other crazy bands that influence you and maybe like, 3% of people will like it, or you can make a product that you are proud of and also people will enjoy. So yeah, it's interesting. It's kind of neat how producers, they're almost like, like therapists. They can kind of bring different 
different things out of different people. And like yep. each one is like different from the, the other one. It's just like it, I always like think it's cool how bands work with different producers. It's like, you know, it's almost like you'd be foolish to a degree to work with the same one every time because you want to be able to have a different set of ears on something or just have a different set of you know inputs on, on things that you're working on and, and kind of help you grow and, and navigate the, the space. I, the only bands I've heard continuously work with the same producer and it's come out better and better and better are probably bands that work with Kevin Shurko. Kevin Shurko is just, a powerhouse of a of a producer and a songwriter and everything he t- he touches turns to gold. Yeah. Yeah. Who does he work with? I, I'm not familiar with that. Uh, he's pretty much been responsible for Five Finger Death Bunch for like okay. most of their career. Logan Mater did Wave the Fist and a bit of Wars the Answer. And then I think Kevin Shurko did everything from that on. I feel like Five Finger Death Punch gets a bad rap. They do. Anybody who's as successful as them is going to get a bad rap. Yeah. They're lucky to get that bad rap because it doesn't phase them with how successful they've been in the industry. Same thing happened to Metallica. Same thing happened to Three Days Grace. Same thing has happened to Breaking Benjamin and Chevelle and Tool and anybody outside of the underground level and releases one or two songs or records that maybe a certain type of person doesn't enjoy all of a sudden, you know, they get about it. even do the Magic dragons, you know, they deserve all of the success they've gotten. Yeah. But I don't know. Their, their most recent, like one or two albums. I, I was a huge fan from the beginning. Yeah. And even as they got like, you know, real, real mainstream, I was still like, this is still good, still good, still good. And then like, they kind of lost me the last couple. I don't know. But it's, it's, they're doing well with it. That's the thing. Sure, so, yeah, it, I mean, the killers did it. Um, I mean, it's, it's just at, at the end of the day, as unhappy people can be, if the person that created the art is happy with their release, it doesn't matter. If they're no. happy with it, and it's, it's, it's doing them well. They're getting the tours that they want. They're seeing the success that they are looking for and they're enjoying their career path. They're enjoying the journey. Like, yeah. Slip not, like- oh, slip not, dude. Like, they, I remember when they released Volume Three and everybody threw a fit. And I was just, that was, that was actually when I was getting into like heavier music. And Slipknot was the doorway for me to discover metal. That's when I started discovering thrash metal, death metal, black metal, you know, metal core, uh, you know, doom metal, all that. Stuff. And that all started from, from hearing duality. That was where it began. Like, before that, the heaviest thing I'd listened to was Metallica. And uh, a buddy of mine showed me that song. And I was like, who, who is this? I was this kid. Well, I wearing masks. And like, I remember thinking, this is one of the heaviest things I've ever heard. And I went to school the next day and I was like, listen, I was like, yeah, man, I've been, I got a t-shirt. I had the whole thing going. And a bunch of dudes were like, man, they suck now. That's the, this is the worst fucking record they've ever released. And it became one of their most popular. Right. And then they skyrocketed. And now like when people think back to those times, they're like, yeah, dude, like volume three is one of the best records they've done. Aside from, of course, you know, Iowa being the heaviest, but yeah. Well, I mean, it's not fair. I mean, I say this a lot on this this show. It's not fair to like, you know, everyone wants bands to sound the same every record, or you know, you, you know, you said Slipknot. Like people think they like they sold out, um, you know, to mainstream all that kind of shit. But like, why else do you do this stuff? And like, you're artists. You're supposed to be creative. You're supposed to take risks and chances and be different than the last. Like, it's like, it's not fair for us as you know, consumers of fans to be mad at them for not creating the same record they made last time. Yep. Yeah. I've even, dude, it's even my friends. Uh, I, I had friends that were extremely supportive of this band when I started it, when it was like the days of, you know, the demos, the the EP that's on the our Spotify. And the moment I started dropping shit that sounds like metamorphosis, which is still like, that's, you know, it's produced by Moyer and Logan, but like we didn't, make it in of it being commercial right or for it wasn't made for radio but it was it's so like well 
polished, very well mixed, very well mastered, very well produced. That like I have a lot of friends that heard it and went, dude, you've already sold out. And I'm like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? I've showed this record to labels and they're like, it's not commercial enough. What do you mean I've sold out? Like, yeah. <laughs> what? So it's it's I, I don't know, man. It's funny. I'll never forget when a day to remember came out with their their album. Uh, I forget the title of the album, but maybe it was like two years ago. They got torched, uh, and I I thought it was great. It's fantastic. They and know. they're live. Oh my god! Yeah. I watched them up a roach a few years back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, speaking of these bands, I are there are a lot of these like kind of inspirations uh, of yours as you kind of you know create. Really, my mood, man. It depends on what I'm listening to. I write. I write many different styles, and that's that's another reason why I've kind of you know we're we're going to, to Johnny Andrews right now it's because he's kind of helping me hone in on one subject, so I don't write five different genres. <laughs> like you know, I was supposed to be getting ready to meet this guy and and work on something for Nocturnal, and last week I woke up and I wrote you know a doo wop song. Hmm. It, it's just like I just when I feel it, I write it. So. It's everything from, you know, Faith No More and Mr. Bongo, a lot of Mike Patton stuff. I do love me some Breaking Benjamin, especially like So Cold Era when I discovered them was like, that was mind boggling music to me. I thought that was so cool. And then, uh, you know, obviously there's the, you know, Chevelle, the bands that sound like them and, and just all, all that stuff, man. Yeah, it's, there's that. But also I learned guitar and I'm extremely influenced by like, um, Gothenburg Sweden bands like you know the Haunted and at the Gates and like thrashier stuff, right? Uh, it's, it's, so it's just I love Prince, I love Bowie, I love all that. It just, it's whatever I'm feeling. Well, recently you just released a single. Uh, it's a cover of the Pesh Mode, correct? Yep. Oh yeah. It's uh, called "It's No Good." So how did that kind of come about? I had it sitting in a Garage Band project since like I don't know. 10 years ago it's i've oh, always wow. wanted that song and i had a pretty rough version of it that i've kind of updated over the years and i have like this list of covers that i love and uh and would love to do and i've recorded so many demos of them by now that we could probably drop a covers record but i think at this point in our career it's kind of pointless because who cares right who cares yet um but uh i care yeah <laughs> i think once we have a bigger audience that can like respect it cool um but while we're still being discovered and i'm still telling people our story I, i'd say dropping a covers record would be a little silly because sure. people are like oh i've never heard of them before and there is a lot of are they a cover band what's going on here but you know we do have a, a another cover in the works here that we might drop as our next single i don't even know what we're doing yet. i don't know if it's going to be an original i've got like 14 written, produced, finished songs ready to go that happened over the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I've got, I've got this song now with Johnny Andrews. I've got something else I'm working on. Too. It's who knows what's next, but like, I've also digressed so much that I don't remember what the question was. Well, not just how that this the cover song came about. The passion of, right. Yeah. yeah, it was, we were working on our next EP and I showed it to Moyer. And he was like, this is tits. Let's do it. And we did it. And, you know, we kind of showed it to our team. And we're like, you know, what's the strongest song out of this handful of songs? And they were like, it's, it's definitely Depeche Mode. Let's drop it. And you had that, you were sitting on that for 10 years. <clears throat> the cover, yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah I mean, I, it came out when I was seven years old. And I'd loved right. it since, you know, since I was seven. So it's... There's just certain songs that never go away. And that was one of them. And so it's cool that I now get to like play it. It's so in my opinion, again, not that it matters, but like um, it's, it's cleaner than the original. Like I really like this song, this version better than the original, just because I think it's cleaner. I mean, back in what was 97, it came out. Um, It was kind of like muddy, which is, you know probably on purpose right but like i feel like your version is just it's it's kind of more polished and cleaner and 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 i I really like it i would blame moyer and logan for that that's a good thing 
And I found out too that uh, Chevelle also covered that at one point. They did actually. I I saw that a while ago um, when I was throwing this idea around because I have that record, and it never crossed my mind. Like I'd completely forgotten about it. And Dude, I brought same. it. Same. And same. we yeah we, we recorded it, and then we were showing a few people. I think it was Matt Pinfield. Somebody was like, oh, yeah, Chevelle did that. And I went, what? They're like, yeah, Chevelle has it covered. And I was like, is it recent? And I looked it up and I was like, oh, okay. It was like years ago. So it's like, there's still, I think, like a, almost a decade between ours and Chevelle's, thankfully. So that's, well, that's usually the rule. Like if the song is at least, you know, 10 years old, it's safe for the cover zone, you know? So when I was looking at it, <clears throat> excuse me, um, that was on there. Well, I don't know, you know, Spotify and, and <clears throat> re-releases. But it was on there. The... Yeah, the o- O2. So that's like 20 some years ago. Yeah. Okay. Which is insane. Oh my God. That was. Yeah. And that was, that was like that album. And I don't know, like when I heard that, I, it just never kind of, you know, clicked. And theirs <laughs> sounds so different too. Yeah. You know, we, we, you know, I'm I'm glad we don't we don't have a lot of similarities in that, even though it's the you know, we covered the same song. So But that's like what's great about, you know, music too. Just like your own take, your own um just your own uh vibe, you know, your own thing. Oh yeah. I love it. But yeah, I thought it was it was very well done. Very well done. And I couldn't believe Chevelle did it, and I can't. I couldn't believe that I didn't recognize that twenty-one years ago. Yeah, it, well, it's funny because you know that song that that record came out when I was twelve. I don't know if I discovered them yet. So you're young. I'm thirty-three. You're a young man. I mean, if that's the music industry. I'm excited. I'm happy for it. I remember being told when I was eighteen, "You've only got till your early twenties to make it." <laughs> and at the time, that was true. And then I got to like 25 and 26, and I was starting to pull my hair out, thinking like, oh, my God, is it too late? And there was like a weird shift. So now all of a sudden, it's like, it's 33 is the new, like, 20. You know what I mean? And it, it doesn't matter. Nobody cares really about your age unless you're, you want to be a pop icon. So Sure, yeah, unless you're trying to sell, sell sex. Exactly. Sell makeup. Sell abs. Yep. As long as you look pretty decent, nobody really cares how old you are. Yeah, I don't know if you still have it, but you're hi- you might be hiding like a mohawk type thing. I recently shaved it. Yeah, go. we got the floor and it was just like I tried to I tried to fix it so many times that it was like it was I don't know you know the tour mohawk that you're seeing a band that's from out of town and you can tell oh that guy shaves it himself. Yeah, it was okay. And I was like, oh, fuck it. Just, it. Fair enough. It grows back, right? Oh yeah, yeah. For I now. Just, I, I change my hairstyle every fucking five weeks. I'm jealous of that. <laughs> my, my hair is actually the longest it's ever been. Well, maybe it's probably as long as it's been once before. Uh, and I'm at, like, I don't know what to do with it. Um, I'm like torn because like I'm 40. Um, like my kids in school. So like I see other parents. And I don't want them to think that I'm a loser. You know, I was like, who's this who's this 40 year old jerk off with this long like like scraggly hair? Like, what are we doing? Like, you're old. Stop it. But I spent like a lot of years, I told you before, I was in um local inter- like media, entertainment magazines, newspapers. Uh, and I was in radio, but like my primary job in radio was sales. So I had to wear the suit and tie every day, clean cut, everything. So now I work for a screen printing company. And, you know, I almost fit in now with the long hair and tattoos and shit like that. Like, nice. so it's cool. But it's like, I'm also 40. And I feel weird at the bus stop with parents who are, you know, wearing suits and shit like that. And don't judge <laughs> me. Don't judge me. That's awesome. No, that's all. <laughs> that's, that's, most, that's what most parents look like in Vegas, at least. That's the scene out there. It's every everybody... Every parent in Vegas is a bartender and covered in tattoos. So you're good. Just trying to fit in. 
not an insult. That's not an insult. Every I, I, and I mean that to say every parent like our age. You know what I mean? Thirties to forties. They look. They look like we're about to go to like a, a concert or something like that. I love it. Okay, I'm fitting in. Yeah, I'm fitting in. <clears throat> you mentioned Matt Pinfield. Do you, do yeah. you know him? Yeah. Like you got our friends. I mean, you know, we're pretty cool. That's sweet. We've uh, we've hung out on quite an occasion. Uh, yeah, he he was there when we met and kind of showcased to E Rake. And man, sitting down with that guy and just talking music is the coolest thing in the world. He is like a, a human encyclopedia of knowledge. And it's, I could do it. I could sit there and talk to him all day. It's so fun. Cause I'm kind of the same way. When I like a band, I obsess over them. I got to know their name. I got to know their age. I got to know when they started. I got to know how long it took for them to be successful. Kind of like what the, what the ingredients were. And then I like to take bands that I love and kind of compare that. Like, what was it about this, you know, this band and this band and this band that all makes sense as to what brought them to the success that they've, they've reached. And uh, so we've, we've had a lot of that, that kind of talk. He's just a cool dude. He's a cool dude. He does cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, he was an icon, like for me growing up, watching MTV and shit like that. Like, yeah. He was a little before my generation, a little bit. Yeah. Like when on MTV, I think I was still watching like Rugrats. It sounds about right. Yeah. So like <laughs> I said, you're 33, I'm 40. I'm, I'm going to be 41 in the next, well, by the time this airs, it'll probably be almost my birthday. Um, oh, happy. Yeah, so well, I mean, it's 41. It's like, it's all over. <laughs> Dude, my guitar player is turning. What is he turning? Uh, actually, maybe I shouldn't disclose it, so never mind. But you're yeah, young. Don't, don't say it. Don't say <laughs> it. He probably looks fantastic. They don't want to give away his age. They look. They do look fantastic. They're, yeah. they're beautiful men with big hair, and, uh, and that's why I put them around me. Take, take the thing off my bald head. That's mm-hmm. funny. Yeah, so I, I I grew up watching Matt Pinfield on MTV back when MTV was cool. I remember who's the other guy? Well, it was Kurt Loader, the music news guy. What was his name? Was it Kurt Loader? No, it was like Tucker, oh. right? Oh, no. Carson Daly. Carson, that's it. What, what was I think? Oh, because Tucker Carlson, Carlson, Carlson. Yeah, yeah. I knew where you were going. I was thinking about no, Carson. No, no, Carson Daly, that guy. Yeah. Yeah. I'm trying to uh, think who else was a, a big. That, I think Carson Daly was like my generation. Yeah, that would make sense because um, he was uh, probably big late late 90s, early 2000s. So that puts me at like 18, 19, 20. So you're a teenager at that point ish. Uh, late 90s. Over t- I turned 10 in 2000. So. Huh. Like my early, my preteens and teenage years was, I believe Carson Daly was like, I think he was like the older guy on the team, but he was like, I just remember news about Bam Margera, you know what I mean? The Jackass crew. Yeah. I remember waking up to go to school and it was like, you know, ludicrous rapping, walking down the street with big hands. Like that was the major video that was on, you know what I mean? Like you just, it was, uh, it was like Maroon 5, you know what I mean? The, yep. the. This love has taken. <laughs> Get it. Get it. Hey, yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah. Oh, three. Oh, three has a big song in oh, three. Yeah. <clears throat> man. Years old, man. It's, wow. uh, yeah. I have this like, it's slowly fading away, but I, like, if I bought the CD, um, I can kind of tell you like what year it came out. Sometimes I could tell you what month it was. Sometimes I could tell you the week. And there's even some, very rare, but like to the almost to the day. Almost to the day. I could feel I feel that though. I'm 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 I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh I I remember when Audio Slave started. And I remember not knowing who Chris Cornell was, but when Like a Stone would play on MTV, I would just be like, like fucking dumbfound. Like I had to have been pretty, pretty young, but uh, yeah, man. 
Well, that was probably early 2000s, right? Yeah. yeah. I remember, I do remember when also, what was, what was the big song that I liked when I was a kid? I had been, it was, I had been the fifth grade, so that had been 2000. So it was like maybe spring of 2000. I was Red Hot Chili Peppers dropped the other side. So what year? I, it had to have been either 99 or 2000. The other Chili side? Pe- other side, yeah. And I was like in love with that video because like the bass player was sitting on the power lines, playing the power lines like a bass. And the imagery was all like wackadoodle. It's great. I want to see. I'm curious now. Curious. <clears throat> I remember being the only kid in my class that like knew the Red Hot Chili Peppers and would like sing like songs like that at school. Everyone else was into like hip hop and rap and pop, and kids were still like in the Backstreet Boys and in sync and ninety eight degrees. Yeah. So yeah, ninety nine. According to Spotify, ninety nine. June eighth, ninety nine. Yeah. It's it's I mean that's why I, I love music so much because it, it it um has such a it just has an impactful uh, just thing about it like again I you know you, you you attach it to moments of your life whether it be high school you know your friends you know a, you know unfortunately a loved one passing away I remember when the Foo Fighters came out with their double disc um, in your honor. 05. Uh, I want to say June. I want to say June 12th. Did my dad pass away on June 13th of that year? But again, it's just, but it's, it's best friends. It's moments of summertime with your, you know, off from school. It's girlfriends. It's, it's all these moments and you like, it's, it's all associated together. And that's one thing I love about music outside of it just being, you know, an amazing thing it just it 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 brings people together it's nostalgic it's it's all these things oh yeah oh yeah it's wild i mean how did you get into music <laughs> uh i mean how far back do you want to go <laughs> <laughs> it's up to you man my first concert was little richard i was single digits when i saw him I was a huge fan of Casper the Friendly Ghost. Okay. And they went to a movie, and I remember he did the Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> so now. Uh, anyway, he, uh, so he played some type of show in Vegas. I don't even remember what casino it was. My mom took me. And <laughs> at the time, she was, she was a little overweight. And I, being a very young kid with, with no sense of social morals or you know what's nice to say and what's not nice to say as children do i'm at this little richard concert and little richard turns to the crowd and he's like where's my big girls at you know i like those big ladies where's my fat girls where they at and he's like you know playing doing his thing and i'm looking and i'm like oh oh being the kid that just wants to mom that's you you're with you're the big girl she's like please stop bren and i'm like no, that's you. They're getting on stage. Go dance with him. That's so fun. She's right here. Like I'm on my seat screaming that my mom is one of the big it was so embarrassing, but I will remember that forever. And uh no, he's amazing though. His music is I was just like awestruck. Um <laughs> I've never told that story to anyone, that's amazing. by the way. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> my family, so sorry. Um, no. I, but what was really cool to later find out is that. Uh, Little Richard was David Bowie's first concert. Okay. And he also pointed out his... No, I'm kidding. I don't <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, so, I mean, I saw Little Richard performing and I was like, damn, wait. I sing on stage. And there have been other bands too I'd seen. Like, you know, my sister introduced me to Metallica. My sister's 19 years older than me, so... She was very much a, a parental figure in my life, practically, because she, she was so much older than me when I was a baby. 
So, you know, she introduced me to bands like Metallica, The Offspring, you know, uh, Styx, like stuff like that when I was a kid. So I was, you know, dancing around my room and singing stuff and all that jazz. And I would like, I would sneak into uh, the living room at night and turn on the TV and watch like Headbangers Ball. I was like, you know, a kid as well. So it just, it kind of came from everywhere. And then when I was like 11, I started choir. And that's when it made sense. It's like, oh, I'm like, I'm singing and I'm doing something that I'm meant to do. At 11 years old, I knew straight up. Like, I was like, oh, like we, we sang our, our, I'll never forget our first piece in choir we did was uh, Phantom of the Opera Medley. And that's how I discovered like, like musicals like that and stuff. And I was just like, this is amazing. I don't ever want to stop doing this. Can you do it? And like, you know, I thought, oh, you could do this for a living. Like people do this, like this is their job. And then nothing else was important to me. Like, I didn't give a fuck. People are like, yeah, make sure you go to college and do all this other stuff. And get, make sure, you know, you find a career path. I'm like, I'm going to be a musician. That's right. it. This is it. Yeah. I started awesome. guitar when I was 14. Started pian- I played piano just even by ear since I was a kid. But uh, don't, yeah, dude, don't let me ramble. I'll ramble for hours. You got to be careful. Dude. You know what? You've had a long day, so you. It, this is all up to you. If you want to go, keep going, keep going. I don't want to keep it too too long, but uh, no. I mean, this is this stuff. This is stuff that I like to hear about. I mean, it's just like, you know, how do you? Because you're, exactly what you're saying. People are trying to deter you from following your dreams. Like, and you at 11 years old, you're like, this is what I want to do. Like, oh. I, I want to do this forever. Like, how can I figure out how to do this? You know, I, I'm very grateful for the choir teachers that I had. And it's very heartbreaking that choir isn't really an elective that people can take anymore in Clark County School District in, in Vegas. It's it's a bit scary, at least last time I heard. Um, it's been years, though. But if it wasn't for my choir teachers, I don't know if I would have been driven enough or inspired enough because I had so many people in my life tell me that it was a pipe dream. I had so many people in my life who just automatically assumed I started doing drugs and drinking as an underage kid when I said I wanted to be a rock star. And right. I didn't really touch a single fucking thing until I was like, you know, in my late, late 18, you know, people, kids are usually getting drunk at parties when they're super young. That wasn't me. I didn't start doing that shit until much later, but like, so you're 21, you follow the rules. I, you know what? I would have drinks here and there. Like I was, I was bar mitzvahed at 13 and I was trying uh, to like save you there. I was trying to save you. Oh, no, I don't give a fuck. It's okay. You know, <laughs> I know, I know. So I, I had a little wine, right? Which, when you're young and that you, you, older people willingly introduce you to alcohol, it tastes mm-hmm. terrible, right? You, it's not the excitement of like, I shouldn't be doing this. So you, you have it, you're like, this is bad. No, I'll have soda instead because it's better. You know, you don't understand why people get drunk or whatever. And then when I was 16, uh, I had my first shot of Jack Daniels. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's all downhill from there. No, but um, what are they saying? Yeah. But just how um, important the. It, yeah, people were not supportive. I mean, my family would always be like, yeah, you're great music. We're a musical family. But they'd be like, but, but have a plan. Have, have a different plan. I, you know, do something else. And I just, no, fuck no. I remember being 14, starting high school. And I went to a, a college. Uh, it was like, it was one of the. It was when they started doing high schools in Vegas where they, they want to set you up for college. So you start going to classes like people would in college. And you, there's, it, it, was, it was very interesting. But you had a homeroom that you'd go to that was like, you know, gets you prepared for secondary education. And they went around on the first fucking day of high school. They were like, you know, we're going to share where you're from and what you want to do. And I said that I, I want to be a professional musician. I want to be a rock star. And the teacher... And the whole class laughed at me. And then the teacher continued to laugh, which caused everyone, obviously, to follow suit. And I was, like, made a joke of because I said I wanted my career to be in music and the arts. And it was kind of like, oh, good luck, buddy. Sure. Yeah, what, what do you really want to do? And that was the attitude of everybody in my life until, like, I became an adult. Now, do you think, so I have my own set of opinions on, you know, if I went back to when I was in high school, like, you know, your guidance counselors, like, in my opinion, they were the worst. They were the worst. Like, they didn't, they had their, 
you know, top five or 10 people that they knew they were going to go to Ivy League schools or going to go be doctors or do whatever. And they definitely help them and guide them into like, you know, filling out the proper paperwork and whatever, X, Y, Z. But outside of, and and I don't think it's exclusive to my school and, and I, or just growing up in general. And I don't, I shouldn't blame them because I think this is how society was kind of directing everyone. But they didn't really do a great job of, of you know, uh, I think recognizing someone's skill set and saying, hey, like, you know, you perform really, really great in uh, you know, shop class and maybe math and things like that and say, have you ever thought of, you know, working in construction or working as a, a, a you know, not a handyman, but like something where shop and math and all those things would apply to you. I just didn't think they did a good job at that. And that's it's, it's unfortunate. But did you... Okay. One, of the, one of the biggest travesties of that is that they don't, they don't teach you about taxes. They don't teach you about financing anything. They don't teach you about credit scores. They don't teach you about responsibilities that are very real. And no matter what path you take in life, you have to be a... Uh, a member of society that isn't just a fucking bum. You know, they don't teach you any of that. Not the important stuff, right? Yeah. But did you take that and were you like, I'm going to fucking prove you all wrong? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, to, to a point. So at the same time I was starting to discover rock music, I also started volunteering at my local haunted house. And every year I would do this thing. And then I decided I wanted to be a part of the haunt industry, the makeup industry. Um, at a very young age, I also, I saw Nightmare on Elm Street and it scared the piss out of me. And my father went, dude, it's fake. It's like uh, people get paid to put stuff on that guy's face. So he looks like that. And I go, I was like, that's a real job? I was like, yeah. I was like, oh, I could do that? So like since a kid, since I was a kid, I loved horror, loved, uh, do, you know, special effects makeup. So I got into that for a while. And then from like, my early 20s into my mid 20s, I did. I ended up getting a job for the thing that Eli Roth had in Vegas, and also got a job. I, I started working in production. That's how I brought home the butter or bacon, butter, bacon, what is it, whatever it is. That's right. how I, yeah, at bread, whatever the fucking term is. I, 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 I kept my lights on with um, with production working for UFC, ESPN, NBA, oh, anything that that gave me, you know, hey, we need a you know, a PA for this or a production coordinator for this. I've worked on set for American Ninja Warrior. I've done commercials for Denny's. I've done, you know, the Billboard Music Awards. I did iHeartRadio. I did, it's just, you know, it's production. It's so awesome. it wasn't until I was like 26 where I was like, okay, all right, I guess I'm doing music. I guess I'm, I literally, I got a divorce and went, guess I'll start a dark rock band. Batman became Batman at 30. Fuck it. It's never too late. So... That's awesome. Divorce. How old? I was twenty six when I got twenty six. Yeah. So you you married young. I did. It's okay. I'm grateful for it. I'm gra- I'm grateful for the experience. I'm grateful for the journey. Um, you know, divorce never ends because people are happy. But you know, I'm happier now. And I, I believe she is too. So that's okay. Life, life lessons. Exactly. Growing, growing moments. Yep. But yeah, it's uh, working on all that, 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 that's all cool stuff. UFC and <clears throat> that's, that's cool. Like, it's not like you, you weren't like flipping burgers at Burger King while you're trying to like, you know, play, play music at. I, mean, I, I've been there. Well, sure. But you know what I'm saying? It's like you, you were like doing, you're still doing okay. stuff that like, I quit Carl's Jr. to open up for Stig's Sorry Speedwagon Ted Nugent in like 20, it's either 2021 or 2022. I was a manager at Carl's Jr. It's, and the fucking store isn't even there anymore. And I won a contest. And I, I they were like, you're going to open up for fucking Stig's Sorry Speedwagon Ted Nugent at Planet Hollywood in front of like 5,000 people. It's not 5,000, but it's like, it was a lot of people. And uh, when you, but when you're that young, you're like, it's like 5,000 people. So it's like sweet. So I told my job, I told my boss, and next the next day on the schedule, it was like important meeting. Like you can't miss it. It's like you gotta go. Mandatory. 
And I was like, I just told you yesterday that I got this amazing gig and it could be good for my career. And they were like, no. it, it's either you go to this meeting or you don't have a job next week. And I looked at her and I went, so do you want tickets to the concert? Like, that's I, awesome. And that's when I stopped flipping, flipping burgers. But I do, I've had every odd job known to man. And I've worked at like probably in a, an uncomfortable amount of sandwich shops. I've worked for Capriati's, Jimmy John's, Porta Sub, Subway, Jersey Mike's, you name it. I did it early 20s. That's awesome, though. It, it's, it's part of who you are today. Yeah. Now, today, are you like a full-time musician? Yes. That's amazing. It's fun. Uh, I, you know, I still try to look for some production work here and there. And if, if, if my buddy's working a gig and he's like, hey, man, like we need somebody, you know, I'll, I'll definitely do it because I, I still love it. I still love working in, in the arts in any manner, right? So it's cool. That's awesome. So, okay. yeah, outside of... of uh, again, when this airs, you'll you'll be on tour with Fozzie. Outside of that, I mean, is that going to wrap up your uh, 2023? We don't have any other tours in the books. We're gonna we're gonna go back to Vegas and we're gonna play something called like a dark arts market, which is like a big smorgasbord of really cool, thrifty, spooky things um, that people like to make and sell, and it's like bunch of artists in the Las Vegas area that are of the 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 darker kind of uh genre it's really fun actually and they've asked us to kind of headline the night so we're gonna we're gonna show up and play some music once everybody's done buying shit and uh it's just it's just an opportunity to kind of I don't know hang out with our with our crew out there have a good time the community is fantastic and the 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 arts community is really really fucking cool and supportive. So we are very uh, blessed to have people that we have in that community. Very cool. And what about twenty twenty four? Any um, you know, big plans, uh, either personally or band wise, or um, you know, maybe nothing solidified yet. But like, is there you know goals you kind of have in your mind that you uh, you want you want to see kind of be fulfilled? If I could talk about it, I would. Okay. All right. Fair enough. <laughs> I'll run this back when when I when I see the news. <laughs> uh, hey, hey, these guys were talking about this back then. There you go. <laughs> Had this in mind. Yeah, this is what he meant. I'll, I'll, I'll pull this back. I'll cut out the clip. Like this is it. This is it. <laughs> Well, cool, man. Um, like I said, I don't want to take up your time. It's I'm sure you have uh, a lot of cool things you want to do in the area you're in, and um, I don't want to take up all your time. So, uh, where can people find you, you guys online? Where Where should people go to 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 learn more about the Nocturnal Affair? Instagram is really cool. TikTok is really cool. Spotify is great. We do have a website. It's just our band name, the Nocturnal Affair dot com. But, you know, you're going to find everything you need to know on TikTok, on, on Instagram. If you got any questions, reach out to us. Maybe we'll answer you. Maybe we'll be occupied by something shiny. Well, it's, so just so you know, I, I've, I tried to follow your band a few days ago when I got this all set up. But I have a, a problem where I follow just, you know, a lot of like, Artists, musicians, entertainers, and all that. And I, and I guess I've met the capacity that you can follow, which is 7,500 on Instagram. So I, I hit, you know, follow and I'm like, okay, I think I, I think I, you know, I followed them. And then you hit me up this morning and it said, follow back. I'm like, I, I, I know I follow these guys already. So, uh, no, I, no, I yeah. no follow back. so that's why I have not, uh, followed back. In case you give, in case you give a shit, <laughs> I'm sure it's not that big a deal. But that doesn't hurt my feelings. It's okay. I know, I know, but it's it's like one of those things. Like, man, yeah, I took the time out of my day to inter- like sit down with an interview with this, this guy. He doesn't look my band, but um, <clears throat> the band name, real quick. Where did that come from? So, um, I was in a metal band when I started this band, 
And we had a 24 hour lockout space that we rented a month, you know, every month. And when this band started, when it was, you know, not too serious, we called it the feels. So I was rehearsing with the feels one night for our first show. And the guitar player and bass player from the metal band walked into the practice space like late at night. Because I practiced at night because that's when the metal band did music. And they just they just went because they left some rolling papers there and they wanted to roll a joint. And so they came to the practice spot to fucking roll a joint and smoke. And they walk in because they're like, they rush in because they hear music being played. And like, what? And they walk in and it's us, you know, playing this goth rock. We're like, oh, hey. And it's like, you know, record scratch stops. Kind of like, like, oh, like awkward silence. They're just like, what are you doing? It's like, I've got a side project. They're like, oh, for how long? Why didn't you tell us? And they started asking me all these questions. Finally, I was like, you know, what do you guys need? We got we to gotta continue rehearsing. And then the next day, they're like, dude, like, why are you playing with them? What's wrong with us? Why are you getting them gigs and not us? What's going on? Do they play, are they are they better players than us? Do you like them more than us? And it so, it sounded like when somebody catches their spouse cheating. Yeah. I like so that. I would, when it was time for me to uh, to <laughs> it was like I was caught having an affair. Mm-hmm. So it was the name I thought the nocturnal affair because it is an affair I was having at night. So that's it. That's funny. I like that. <laughs> Yeah, definitely didn't choose it. It wasn't like a serious, like, oh, we are creatures of the nocturnal type. <laughs> this band is the affair that happens at the night, and I take everything seriously. It's not as. That's awesome. That's awesome. It's fun. <laughs> well, dude, you know, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. Um, looking forward to uh, the news that you'll break eventually. Thanks, man. Appreciate uh, that. I, I, mean, I wish you uh, the best of luck on tour with Fozzie Safe Travels. Hope you guys kill it. Um, anyone out there watching and listening, please check these guys out. The music's great. Uh, and you're a cool dude. I mean, that's it. it makes it even better. You too, man. I appreciate it. So thank you so much. And uh, Thanks, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure I, I unfollow enough people so they can follow you to keep tabs on what you're doing. That's basically what I'm getting at. It's like, dude, just follow us on TikTok. I think you can follow like millions of people dude, on TikTok. Uh, real quick, I'm sorry, but TikTok? Like, what are you guys doing on TikTok? Everything. Um, are you we, guys funny? It's, I mean, it's, I don't do it. It's our friend Jessica, who also does foggy stuff. And she's like a TikTok genius. Like, she's like one of the biggest TikTok influencers out there. She was invited to like the big old TikTok event, was on the red carpet, asked questions by like it was she's hilarious. She's great. And I've learned a lot about social media because I don't know shit about content. And frankly, I don't care. Like, cause I'm like, I'm so focused on like, what am I gonna what's what's the next song? What's the next move for Nocturnal? You know, who who are we gonna talk to next? Are we talking to a label? You know, we just got an agent. What's the next tour? What's the and that's all I think about every day. What can move us forward? And sometimes like posting to the rest of the world and being like, hey, look at us, we're the nocturnal affair, doesn't cross my mind. I'm so busy like trying to talk to management, trying to talk to just trying to write, trying to get all the fucking other noise out of my mind, you know. And I avoid social media because if I don't, I won't write because I'll just sit there and I'll scroll. For hours after I wake up, and then and hate, and hate people, and yeah. like, yeah, it's scary. So, well, you just got one more follower on TikTok. Uh, <laughs> I I don't know how to utilize it. I I mean, this is a oh That's shit, happening. whoa, what's happening? Whoa, whoa, how? Do, what is that a thing? I don't know. Well, I don't know what you did. I, what? <laughs> This, what's happening? What is this? What? Is, it's not working for me. Come on. Are, do you have an iPhone? Oh, you're on your iPhone. Yeah, I'm not on my iPhone. What the hell? Wow. 
I don't know what's happening, but that's hilarious. That's amazing. All right. Yeah, I'll let well, you go. Yeah, man. I'll see you on the internet. Hell yeah. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Take it easy. All right, we'll see you. Oh, what, what was that? Do you see that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is amazing. I learned so much tonight in the last 10 seconds. <laughs> All right, man. Thanks. We'll see you. Yeah. <laughs>